Inferential statistics. Inferential statistics involves collecting and analyzing information from samples in order to draw conclusions or inferences about a larger population. And inferential statistics involves hypothesis. A hypothesis is a logical supposition or an educated or a reasonable guess. And we want to answer uh, the hypothesis once it's been set up. And hypothesis uh, for research provides directions for the research. Uh, as well as the framework. There are two types of hypotheses, directional and non-directional. Directional hypothesis suggests a direction, whether we're talking about a relationship or difference. So in the case of a uh, relationship, a directional hypothesis uh, would assert that the, the hypothesis is either positive or negative. In the case of the difference of means, a directional would suggest that one is greater than or less than, using the symbols, the greater than and the less than. For example, here's an example of a directional hypothesis. There is a positive relationship between achievement and attendance for the elementary school children. So positive is the direction that this suggests. Right? So therefore, this becomes a directional hypothesis. There's another type of hypothesis called a non-directional, and this suggests that there is no direction to your hypothesis. So using the same example then, a non-directional hypothesis would say that there is a relationship between achievement and attendance for elementary school children. Notice that there is uh, no positive or negative uh, suggested here in the statement. And in uh, setting up the hypothesis, we would use the symbols equal or equal not signs. Because there's a bit of a redundancy to do both, because once we know that um, in a non-directional hypothesis that there is a relationship, then by just looking at the numbers, we know if it's positive or negative. So there is that overlap or redundancy to do both. And so uh, for the remainder of this discussion, we're going to only focus on the non-directional hypothesis. When we we're doing the hypothesis testing, we always start out with a null hypothesis. Null hypothesis suggests that there is nothing or no relationship or no difference, right? And the symbol we use is HO for hypothesis null, right? For example, even if we know that there is a relationship between achievement and attendance for elementary school children, a null hypothesis would say that there is no relationship, right? Because a null hypothesis has to state that there is really nothing there. So it would say there is no relationship between achievement and attendance. And when we're doing hypothesis testing, we set up this null hypothesis and we try to prove that wrong or try to find ways to reject that null hypothesis in favor of finding there to be something or a relationship or a difference. And that's stated by the alternative hypothesis. So the al alternative hypothesis is opposite to the null hypothesis. We use the symbols H1 or H2 or and so on for multiple alternative hypotheses, but for the purpose of this discussion, there's going to be one alternative hypothesis. So we're going to use the symbol HA, okay? Hypothesis alternative. So keep in mind that the alternative hypothesis is a direct opposite to the null hypothesis. And as a researcher, you want to be able to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis so that you are able to make a conclusion to the effect of there being a relationship or that there, or there being a difference between two things that you are comparing. So let's do hypothesis testing. So the key question here is, are two means alike? So we're comparing two means. And the two means we're going to compare are the sample mean and the population mean. And we choose to do either a z-test or t-test to compare these two means. Here's a question. Do my pills work? IQ pills. Okay. So let's assume that with my spare time, I like to work with chemistry and put some chemicals together to enhance or increase uh, one's IQ level, right? So we know that in the population, 
uh, the mean or the population mean or the true mean is 100, the standard deviation of 15. So that's known information. We've known this uh, throughout um, many tests, many IQ tests that have been done. And so notice the mu and the sigma that I use to indicate that this is information about the population. So here's information about the sample. Let's say that I was able to collect 100 brave souls to be able to uh, be in my study and take my IQ pills to be tested to see if the pills work. So after a duration of time of taking this um, IQ pill, let's say that my sample mean came out to be 105. So we know that the population mean is 100. They were at 100 before they took the pills. Now after the pills, their sample mean came out to be 105. So the question is, did that increase of five points in IQ attributable to the IQ pills, or did it happen by chance? That we can assume that, yeah, there's a little bit of an increase, but it's not significant enough for me to be able to label on the bottle uh, to say that it significantly increases their IQ pills. So the question here to be tested is, is there a difference between the population mean and sample mean? The population mean being 100 and the sample mean from 100 brave, brave souls in my study of 105. Essentially, the question is, is there a statistical difference between 100 and 105? So here's what we want to set up for HO and HA. HO, if you remember, is the symbol for null hypothesis. And it would state that if you were to take one mean away from the other, the difference would be zero. Okay, so M1 minus M2 equals zero. Or to say the two means, 100 and 105, are assumed to be the same, not statistically different. And the alternative hypothesis with the symbol HA would say the exact opposite, right? So if you were to take one mean away from the other, there is a difference. The difference is not zero. Or to say that 100 is statistically different from 105. So we set up the HO and HA. And again, when we're doing hypothesis testing, either using a z-test or t-test, we're going to try to reject the null hypothesis so that we can be in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So now the question of z-test and t-test, how do you decide? So here are the formulas, and if you look at it carefully, the difference between the z-obtained and the t-obtained uh, formulas comes down to the standard deviation of the population and the standard deviation of the estimated population. So if the standard deviation of the population, the sigma, right, the little circle with the tail, if the standard deviation of the population is known to us, then it says to use the z-test, and that's because we can plug in all the numbers to calculate for a z-obtained. But in the case that the standard deviation of the population is not known, not known to us, then we have to estimate it. And we're going to estimate it uh, using the calculation for a computational formula uh, of the standard deviation of the estimated population. Right? So that's going to be um, the sum of x squared minus the sum of x. Right? We know this formula all divided by n minus 1. Of course, this whole thing square rooted. Okay. So we know that this is the formula for, computational formula for the estimated population, right, for the standard deviation. So we would use this calculation, use this formula to do the calculation for uh, this little s, right, which is the standard deviation of the estimated population. So we're basically estimating the standard deviation of, of the population, right? So if that's the case, then what we're calculating becomes your t obtained. So now we are doing a t test uh, when we have an estimated standard deviation. In the case of the example of the IQ pills, we would do a z-test because the standard deviation of the population is known. Here's that information, right? So here's the population information, the sample information. Let's do a calculation now for the z-obtained. Plugging in all the numbers, the x-bar is 105 
minus the mu of 100 divided by the standard deviation of the population over the square root of 100 brave souls. Okay? So the calculation comes out to be 3.33. So now the question is, what does that mean? We ultimately want to be able to uh, either reject or retain the null hypothesis, right? Because this is a hypothesis testing. So once we have a Z obtained, then we're ready to put it on a scale, right? Um, so here's a scale. A scale is such that you have a normal distribution. And notice the, um, the region marked by plus or minus 1.96. And that's not an arbitrary number. And in any science, we assume it's, there's some level of error, right? And the error is marked by this little Greek letter alpha. And the normal level of uh, error that we expect in any research is 5% error, or 0.05. And we say that we make our decision to accept or reject a null at the alpha level of 0.05, which means that there's 5% chance of error. And that's the most common, uh, common level of error that we um, ex expect. All right? So when alpha is 0.05, the Z crit, or the critical value of Z, is 1.96 on either side. And that's where 1.96 comes from. But here's why this is a good scale. If your Z obtained, the one we just calculated, falls within these points, plus or minus 1.96, which is what we we'll call an acceptance region, we accept the null hypothesis. And we say that the null hypothesis is true. If our Z obtained falls outside uh, plus 1.96 or negative 1.96, these tails, which we call the rejection region or the critical region, then we're going to simply reject the null hypothesis. Notice that we're always talking about the null hypothesis, right? Because that's what we're testing, the null hypothesis. We never test the alternative hypothesis because we know what to do with the alternative hypothesis once we know to either accept or reject the null hypothesis because they are exact opposite statements. Now, there are different levels of error that we can choose from. So the most common one and how this scale is created is using the alpha of 0.05. So it says at the bottom, uh, when you use alpha of 0.05, that gives you 95% level of confidence with your decision, right? And it says to use plus or minus 1.96 to um, separate the acceptance region from the rejection regions. But if our Z obtained is large enough and we could reject the null hypothesis quite easily, then we can kind of push the envelope a little bit and use alpha 0.01 to see if we can still reject the null, right? Because ultimately we want to be able to reject the null hypothesis, right? So with alpha 0.01 then, that gives us 99% of level of confidence. But that also means that the rejection regions become smaller. So we're using plus or minus 2.575, okay? So instead of 1.96, we would be using that number, okay? So that increases the acceptance region and makes the rejection region much more stringent, right? So this of the three would be the most robust um, uh, level uh, of alpha, right? And then if at 0 0.05, which would be a good starting point, uh, you're not able to reject a null, then you can try um, an alpha level of 0.1, which is more lenient, right? That gives you 90% level of confidence, which means you have 10% chance of error. But that's still acceptable if you can reject the null hypothesis at that level. So then the cutoff for the alpha of 0.1 would be plus or minus 1.645, which makes the acceptance region smaller and the rejection region much more wide, but that gives you 10% chance of error. But we always start out point of, with 0 0.05 as the beginning point and decide whether you want to become much more stringent or lenient based on your Z obtained. So let's start with 0 0.05. So here is the Z crit or the scale, and we notice that 3.33, our Z obtained, falls in the rejection region. But I also noticed that 3.33 is by far a very large number compared to the, uh, the cutoff of 1.96.
So I might try using the alpha of 0.01, right, which gives you the cutoff of 2.575, and you notice that our Z obtained is larger than even that, and so we would still be able to reject a null at 0.01. So then going back to the question of is there a difference between the population mean and the sample mean or is there a statistical difference between 100 and 105, we could say something like this as the conclusion. The Z obtained of 3.33 falls in the critical region or the rejection region, region with the Z crit of 1.96 and we would in parentheses indicate the alpha level, right, alpha of 0.05. And we would, we would then conclude, therefore, the result indicates a significant difference between the population mean and the sample mean of IQ test scores. And we would say, everyday term, the pills do work. But we also know that at, we can afford the alpha of 0.01, so it's already underlined. So we're using the secret then of 2.575, and in parentheses indicate that that's for the alpha of 0.01. Same result, but we can provide these numbers, right, underlined, to show that this is a pretty strong statement, right? Um, this states that there's really less than 1% chance of error with our conclusion. So we would say that this statement is a better statement and a stronger statement for um, our research. In the case that our Z obtained falls in the acceptance region, um, this is what a conclusion would look like. Z obtained falls in the acceptance region, therefore the result indicates no significant difference between the population mean and the sample mean of IQ test scores. Pills do not work. Right? That would be our ultimate conclusion, which would mean that I have to go back to the chemicals and reconfigure um, to see if I can come up with better pills. So here is um, a summary of step-by-step -step way of uh, conducting a Z-test or a T-test, although we haven't talked about the t-test yet. It's very similar and it follows the same nine steps. So the first thing we want to do in a hypothesis testing, as you have seen before, is to state the null and the alternative hypothesis. Right? So you want to state the HO right? and then the HA. And then it says to obtain whether to carry out a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. We know that um, in, the, in an earlier discussion about the directional and the non-directional, we decided that we would go with the non-directional hypothesis. And you also notice that when we set up the HO and HA, we used equal and equal not signs. So a non-directional test is, by default, the two-tailed test. So we're not interested in any direction or a one-tailed test. We're interested in establishing whether two numbers are uh, statistically the same or statistically different. So the answer to step two would be a two-tailed test, right? And then in step three says to select a significance level alpha. We always start out with 0.05, right, as a good starting point. And then if we can afford it, um, if our T obtained or Z obtained is large enough, then we can try a more stringent alpha of 0.01 or if our T obtained or Z obtained is not very strong and you still want to try to uh, reject a null, then we can try the more re uh, lenient one of alpha of 0.1. So for now, alpha of 0.05 would be a good starting point unless otherwise indicated in the question. Then we want to go to step four um, to decide whether to do a t-test or a z-test. And we know that that depends on whether we have this information, right? That little circle with the tail at the top, um, that is uh, the standard deviation of the population. Okay? So if we know that information, we can do the z-test. But if we don't, we have to estimate and, you, and do the t-test. And then whether we do a t-test or z-test, uh, we would then create a scale, okay? So we kind of walk through the z crit scale where we talked about the three levels of alpha and the cutoffs for the acceptance region and the rejection region. t crit works very much the same way, except we have a little more options there as we'll see uh, in a minute. So whether you're doing, if you're doing a t-test, you would produce a t crit for the scale. If you're doing a z-test, then we would create a z-crit for the scale. And then number six is to calculate. So we're going to either, you're doing a, whether you're doing a t-test or z-test, we would do the calculation. And then step seven, eight, nine have to do with now 
uh, the results and conclusions. So in step seven, it says determine whether the observed value of the test statistic falls in the critical region. So where does it fall? Does our T obtained or Z obtained uh, fall in the acceptance region or the rejection region? And based on that, in step eight, we're going to accept or reject a null hypothesis. And then finally, in step nine, we're going to state our conclusion, such as the pills don't work. So let's walk through the t-test now. It's very similar. Um, and so um, I'm using the same numbers here, um, except notice that the symbol here was changed out to S. And we know that S is, stands for the standard deviation of the estimated population. Okay? So once we have just that information and not the actual population standard deviation, we're going to resort to doing a t-test and calculate for t-obtained. So we're using the same numbers here so that it just, just uh, is easier for you to follow. So our T obtained now is 3.33. So what do we do with that number? Uh, similar to what we did with the Z test where we then put it on a scale called Z crit, we're going to do the same thing, put it on a scale for Z crit. But in order to find the Z crit or the critical number to cut off the acceptance region from the rejection region, we have a little bit of work to do because this T crit table has many options uh, for you to decide uh, what is the right T crit for your test. So let's become familiar with this T crit table. First of all, in the first column, it says the degrees of freedom, right? Degrees of freedom is really N minus one. Okay, so whatever our n is, we subtract 1, and that becomes our degree of freedom. So we know that uh, with the IQ test pills, um, there were 100 brave souls. Right? So the degrees of freedom then would be n minus 1, or 99. So we look for 99 in the first column, and you notice that 99 does not exist. Right? So we are down to either 60 or 120. We would choose the smaller number, 60, because we have 60 cases, more than 60 cases, right? But we have at least 60. We can't select 120 because uh, we only have 100 brave souls, right? 120 would not be the correct uh, number. So we're going to go conservative, right? And use a smaller degrees of freedom to read off our T crit. So we're down to now this, this um, row here uh, where the degrees of freedom is 60. So that's a lot of narrowing down, uh, down to about three possibil or five possibilities here. Now to select the column, um, the column is labeled by these little numbers here, right? And it says it's the amount of alpha in one tail, okay? So, which means that um, we need to really double up these numbers to know our alpha. So our alpha here for 0.1 would be 0.2, because it's double that. And this would be 0 0.10. And then this would be, I'm just doubling up the numbers, 0 0.05 and 0 0.02. And this would be 0 0.01, okay? So those would be your alphas. But we also know that, as we have talked about in the Z-crit, uh, we're using just three alphas, because those are the most commonly used ones, 0.05, and then the more stringent one of 0.01, and the most uh, lenient one of 0.1. So that's what we're going to stick to, and select only those columns that are indicated by these alphas, right? So that means we're, no, we're not going to use this column, and this column. So that eliminated the two columns um, and uh, gave us the three possibilities now. So at the alpha of 0.1, we have the t-crit of 1.671, at the alpha of 0 0.05, 2.0, and at the alpha of 0 0.01, 2.660, okay? So let's start out with 0.05, right? This column, um, and I have boxed in here the t-crit of 2.000. So that's a good number to use. Uh, to set up the acceptance region from the rejection region. So here's um, the scale with the T crit of plus or minus 2.00. So now we know the acceptance and the rejection regions have been separated by that number. Our T obtained, if you remember, was 3.33, and it falls in the rejection region and is much higher than 2.00. Very nice number, right? 
Um, so we know that we want to reject the null hypothesis at the 0.05 level. Okay. Can we reject the null at the 0.01 level? If you go back to the table here, we know that the, at 0.01 level, the T crit is 2.660. And we could still reject the null if we move the 2.00 out to 2.660 and still be able to reject the null. Okay. All right, so to answer the question then, to this question, is there a difference between the population mean and the sample mean? Uh, this is what we would uh, report. The result indicates a significant difference between the population mean and the sample mean of IQ test scores. And notice these um, symbols that we use to kind of summarize what we did. So in brackets, then, we see T to indicate that we did a t-test. And any guesses on what 99 is? That's the degree of freedom, right? Because we know that there were 100 people, and n minus 1 of 99 is your degrees of freedom. So 3.33 is your t obtained, right? So that's reported. And we also know that 0.01 over here is your alpha, right? Because we indicated that that's the alpha level that we choose, right? Because we could still reject a null at that point. But notice here, p less than, right? So p less than is used to show that our t obtained was significant, right? That it was in the uh, rejection region um, at the 0.01 level. So when we're reporting a significant difference, we use the symbol p less than. If we're reporting a not significant difference, then we would use p greater than, right? This is for not significant. But in this case, we know that our T obtained was a nice big number and clearly in the rejection region. So we're going to use the symbol P less than to indicate that there was a significant difference.